Hello, my name is Vince Cerf. I'm Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, and I appreciate the opportunity to address you on the topic of leading ethically in an age of AI and big data. I'd like to focus my attention on ethics and software, because that's where almost all the rubber meets the road in online environments. If without the software, nothing happens. It is that which animates all of the various applications and devices that we seem to use increasingly on a daily basis from minute to minute. So let's talk a little bit about software. I think you might agree with me that it's essential that the software you use be reliable that it be safe to use, who would want to use unsafe software, that it be secure, and that it preserves your privacy, and that it exhibits ethical characteristics. So what could I possibly mean by that? Well, let me just start out by suggesting to you that companies that produce software and rely on software to provide you with products and services do well to adopt a kind of transparency so that you know what you're getting, you know what to expect, you know how the software is intended to work, you know what the intentions of the company are. So transparency is your friend and their friend as well. Second, I think accountability is essential. If we are going to rely on software produced by others, we would expect them to be accountable for how well that software works, and if indeed it is not functioning properly, that they have a responsibility for correcting those errors and doing so for the lifetime of the product. And finally, I think agency is a very important aspect of all of this because the users of the software uh, and those companies, for example, that are relying on the software need agency in order to act in their own uh, protection. They need to have tools uh, to protect themselves, to expose potential attacks or potential hazards uh, in their use of the software. And so agency and accountability are two watchwords, at least in my world. But now let's turn to why these are issues at all. And that has to do with bugs in software. Uh, I was mesmerized early on in my career by the idea that you could create your own universe, uh, you know, by writing a piece of software and then telling it what to do. And it did what you told it to do, except I soon learned that it does what you tell it to do, but not necessarily what you want it to do. And the difference between those two is typically a bug. And I learned early on how easy it was to create bugs and how hard it was to find them. And so here's a challenge for our research community, computer science research community, to figure out how to design and build better software development environments so that we can be alerted to mistakes that we've made before the software is actually released so-called into the wild. Now, I don't know about you, but I used to make a living writing software and I have a little dent here in the middle of my forehead from all the times when I discovered a mistake I'd made, a bug I'd found going, ah, how could I possibly have done such a stupid thing? It's amazing how many of these mistakes are really, it's really stupid, some simple-minded mistakes like going through a loop more times than you should, or pointing to something but it's off by one, or making reference to a variable that never gets set so you're branching conditionally on random data. These are all, or how about a, a reading data in and not allowing enough room for the data so it lands where it doesn't belong and gets executed accidentally or deliberately as code, which is how a lot of the software attacks against uh, software uh, work because people just read in data that overlays the parts of the executable software and then it takes off going where you didn't intend it to go. So these are all mistakes that are 
easily rectified if you find them in time. But suppose you don't. Let's suppose that the software gets out there into the wild and it then is discovered that there are bugs that are hazardous and perhaps even that people are exploiting. So what do you do? Well, a, an, an accountable organization, an ethical organization, would commit to updating the software. But there are implications about safe update. For one thing, the receiving software system, you know, your laptop or your pad or desktop or IoT device, needs to be assured that the software came from where it's supposed to come from, from a, uh, a known uh, origin. And that's where digital signatures can be your friend to confirm where this data came from. And second, you want to make sure that the data that you're loading, the new software update, uh, has integrity. And again, digital signatures are your friend here because once the software update is signed, it's not possible for someone else to alter it without it being visible, unless, of course, they manage to crack the crypto code. And that's why we want uh, very high quality public key crypto in order to prevent that from happening. So uh, certainly we would expect ethical companies to do a safe and secure job of updating their software and committing to updating it for the lifetime of the product uh, that's, uh, that's relying on that particular software. This problem, by the way, is not uh, purely domestic. In fact, the situation is that the network, uh, the internet in particular, on top of which the World Wide Web runs, is global in scope, and it was designed on purpose that way. But the implications are that the sources of software may be in one jurisdiction, and the recipient and user may be in another. And so there needs to be cooperation across international boundaries in order to assure integrity and agency for those who are relying on software coming from a variety of different sources. I might point out, by the way, that one of the most popular sources of software is called open source software coming from uh, libraries all around the world, places like uh, GitHub and GitLab and SourceForge and a variety of others. And it's very enticing and attractive because it's free, for one thing. Um, and, you know, what's not to like about free software? Well, there is one thing not to like about it. It might not be well maintained. And in fact, sometimes it's very understaffed and bugs get in and are not detected until many years later. And then, of course, they cause all kinds of trouble. So one of the most important things anyone can do that's serious about using open source software is to make sure that it is scrutinized for potential bugs and hazards and corrections are made before they are actually put into live products that are distributed to customers who are relying on them. So there are a long list of things that I consider to be part of the ethical framework, especially for dealing with software. And of course, uh, the ethical questions extend far beyond that. They go to all kinds of business practices and disclosures, uh, commitments to support for users uh, and for product lifetimes. And in fact, one might even ask, what about companies that might potentially go out of business or decide to sunset a particular product, they might consider the possibility of escrowing the source code so that a third party could undertake to continue to support it in the event that there are still people relying on it. So there are a number of ways in which ethical behaviors could be uh, instantiated. And I hope in the course of uh, this work that we'll be able to catalog what those behaviors are and offer good advice to steer companies, governments, and users in the direction of ethical safety and security. Well, I hope this has been a little bit helpful. It's brief, but I sincerely look forward to hearing and seeing what others have had to say on this topic. There's much to learn and much to do. And I know that uh, I personally and Google are very, very committed to making an ethical world better